Hello, everyone. Um, I welcome you all to, to join this uh, meeting on diabetes and mental health challenges for students and families. This is an online event um, hosted by IDF and ISPAD. My name is uh, Gunther Schander from Gothenburg, Sweden. And uh, I welcome you all, as I said, to this webinar. We have some uh, housekeeping rules. This webinar will be recorded and you can activate the Zoom generated subtitles for this webinar by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom window. And please note these subtitles will not be 100% accurate. The, the recording slides and feedback questionnaire will be sent to all registrants in a few days. And the participants who attend this event uh, live for at least uh, 60 minutes will receive an attendance certificate. And please use the Q&A function to post your questions to speakers and panelists. The first speaker is Professor Natasa Bratina from um, University Children's Hospital of Ljubljana in Slovenia. And the, the heading is the impact of, impact of diagnosis and self-management in mental health. Please, Natasa. Hello, everybody. I'm sending you nice greetings from rainy Ljubljana. It's a great pleasure to be part of this group. Um, I would like to share you some insights into mental health of our patients. So uh, if we look back 50 or 70 years ago, having diabetes was just a fight for survival without physical activity, strict food restriction and fixed insulin dose. But then 50 years ago, self-control entered everyday life and families and children learned how to change the insulin dose. But now, last 20 years uh, is the period of time where modern technology gives new opportunities. We have new insulin, active children. We are teaching families, teachers, and goals are stricter. Next slide. So it is very important that we have ISPAT clinical practical uh, practice consensus guidelines on uh, psychological care of children and adolescents with type 1 diabetes with a very important update from 2022 that will soon be published. Next slide. So what is one of the main topics in these uh, guidelines? Of course, we must be aware of emotional factors, especially depression that can appear in children. And from some literature, it is well known that nearly twice as common in patients with diabetes and as in general uh, population, but the results are not so conclusive. So we need further research. Next slide. What is important that usually after diagnosis, everything is focused on stabilization of the blood glucose. And we want to find the best insulin regimen for the child. We want to know how to measure blood glucose. And of course, it's also time for the educational support when psychologists meet the family, as well as uh, discussions with dietitians, doctors, and other members of the team find place. Next slide. So what our parents usually asking is, what is the best for my child? And we can discuss timing range, average blood glucose, HbA1c. Some parents even want to go stricter and want explanations why. But how do we approach the child? Where are his or her feelings? Next. Child is usually asking, why me? because suddenly he's in the middle of living with a chronic disease. Next. And of course, we expect that children understand the theory and they follow rules about food, exercise, blood glucose monitoring, changing the insulin doses. They, might, they must respond to pump or sensor warnings. And suddenly they have to work together with doctors and the diabetes team, no matter if they like them or not, and bonds in the family can again become stronger. Next. So is it easy? Next. Or can this be a big challenge? Next. 
What is important is that every member of the team must to know how to express empathy to the child. We have to create a trusting atmosphere. We must accept uh, ch uh, children wishes, but not approve everything. And it is important that we are uh, capable to do reflective listening, asking open questions, gentle probe for more details, use of summaries and reflections. Next. Because some of children will be, even with all support, lost in translation. If they fail to show up for clinical appointments, there is a bigger risk for poor glycemic control. If they miss screening tests for complication, again, we are focusing increased risk for development and progression of diabetic completion. We have more visits to the emergency room and, of course, increased risk of chronic complication in the patients with a long time lapse from the pediatric to first adult clinic visit can be a problem. Next. So, life with diabetes is a 24-7 job. Children and parents are involved as well. The burden can be high, sometimes too big if not recognized early enough and screening and support from all members of the team and available technology can be of help. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha, for this brilliant introduction to the, to the um, mental health uh, issue that we are talking about today. Now, Ellen, Professor Ellen Delamater, it's your turn, please. Hello, thank you very much. Um, it's great to see so many people from so many parts of the world here today for this important meeting. Um, so I'm gonna talk about stigma and uh, discrimination and um, how that affects kids with diabetes. Well, we know that psychological factors are very, very important. Um, kids with diabetes have high rates of psychological disorders such as depression, anxiety, disordered eating patterns, but we also know that diabetes distress is very, very common. And it's important to note the difference between distress and psychological disorders, things that we diagnose. Um, diabetes distress is not a, a psychological disorder per se, is not a diagnosis that we give, but it is a common phenomenon. All of these factors can interfere and usually do interfere with su successful diabetes management and have an adverse impact on quality of life. Next slide, please. The other thing that's really important is family factors. Um, and again, we have a decades worth of research that has shown this to be a fact. Family conflict is associated with decreased regimen adherence, um, suboptimal glycemic control. We know that supportive parental behaviors, clear communications, shared responsibility, monitoring their children's self-management behaviors, having structured routines in the families, supporting the autonomy of the child when the child is responsible enough to have that. All of these factors are associated with better adherence, better glycemic control. Next, please. When we talk about kids, we're also talking about their peers. Um, in adolescents in particular, the major developmental issues that they face are achieving peer group identity, being accepted by their friends, developing their social skills, their social relationships, and mainly to, to be able to fit in, to not feel different. Um, we all get by with a little help from our friends. Uh, there is actually a, a literature and the research on peers and diabetes. And back um, going back to 1995, one of my friends and colleagues in the field, Annette LaGreca uh, published a study that looked at the ways in which kids felt peer and family support was uh, impacting their diabetes. And, and, and in fact, kids with diabetes did note that friends, their friends provide a lot of emotional support for them as they go through the day with managing diabetes. Um, now, a review was, was published in 2012 uh, by Helgeson and colleagues, and it showed that Qualitative studies uh, reveal that teens believe their peers have an, an impact on their diabetes self-management, but the more quantitative studies were less conclusive. However, we know that there's more evidence that social conflict 
was harmful um, and, and, and more so than social support was helpful. Um, very recently, Helgeson and her colleagues uh, published another study. This was a longitudinal study uh, with a fairly large group of kids with diabetes that were enrolled around age 10 and 11, followed for 11 years, and compared with a control group of kids without diabetes. These studies showed that uh, males, some, some sex differences, so that males with diabetes reported less friend support and companionship. Females with diabetes reported less friend support and more romantic conflict in their relationships. And, and these results suggest that kids with diabetes do have some challenges in terms of their social development and their peer relationships. Next slide. So this brings us to the issue of stigma. Stigma is a negative social judgment that leads to unwarranted rejection or exclusion. And it is often related to visible features of a disease or its management that makes one feel and look different. So it is characterized by labeling or negative stereotyping, kind of the us versus them attitude. And for the patient could be a loss of status or, and even discrimination. Stigma may be experienced, so, or in which case it's actually happening that people are uh, behaving towards them in ways that um, lead to rejection, uh, or it just may be perceived, which means basically that the patient can have a self-stigmatization, an internalization, and even an acceptance of the stigma. Next, please. So what do we know about stigma in diabetes? Uh, there actually is not a huge literature on this topic, but there are some studies. Um, there was a qualitative study done uh, recently, well, five years ago or so, uh, four years ago in Puerto Rico. Uh, and it indicated that of 65 kids, two thirds of them reported diabetes related stigma. And in this study, they identified um, social stigma which is what others do to them, as well as internalized stigma, the perception that kids feel different. And an example of the social stigma where a child who was taking injections was told by their peers, they, they call me a junkie, or the kid is saying they call me a junkie because I'm using a, an injection needle. <clears throat> or the internalized stigma example, at times I don't even feel the same as others. To the degree that kids experience stigma, diabetes-related stigma, they also reported depressive symptoms. And where did this come from? The social stigma it came from their peers. Next. And this study um, was done in, the next study was done in Canada in, again, in 2018. Uh, it was a web-based survey that, uh, that, that got kids from all over the country to participate. So 380 kids with type 1 diabetes and young adults up to age 24 reported on diabetes-related stigma defined by three factors. One is avoiding diabetes management when, when friends are present, difficulty telling peers about their diagnosis, or embarrassment engaging in diabetes self-care when others are present. The prevalence of diabetes-related stigma in this study, 380 kids, was two-thirds, 65.5%. And Really important finding, I think. Diabetes-related stigma was associated with increased risks for suboptimal metabolic control. So there were three times the risk of kids who experienced stigma uh, for having A1C greater than 9% or 75 millimoles. 1.86 times the risk for severe hypoglycemia requiring intervention. And in this study, it's important to note the patients themselves who participated in the survey also provided a sample of blood that was analyzed for A1C at the central laboratory. So I think we could, we could say um, that these results are reliable. Next, please. And jumping to another country, uh, this study Helen, was done. Helen, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you have to come to the conclusion. Okay, so. I'm coming. I, I've got another slide or two. Um, this study was done in Turkey. Uh, basically looks the same sort of thing, but examines stigma as a predictor of negative perceptions about insulin treatment. And that's exactly what they found, uh, fear of stigmatization, not informing their peers and preferring to inject alone, all associated with negative attitudes about insulin treatment. Next slide. Uh, and I'll finally just mention before concluding uh, the topic of bullying. Uh, this was um, 
I, I published very recently uh, in 2019, a review paper. And actually, there are only four papers published in the last 20 years or so that were met the criteria for inclusion. All of these show the high rates of victimization that kids with diabetes experience compared with healthy peers or other kids with chronic illness. Two of these studies done by the same team, Storch and colleagues, found associations between bullying and suboptimal uh, glycemic control. Um, so clearly, you know, there are challenges with stigmatization, socialization, social support, and diabetes management in public environments. And in conclusion, next slide. Uh, diabetes distress and stigmatization concerns are significant issues for kids with diabetes. These concerns are really highly prevalent and are associated with suboptimal diabetes management as well as psychological adjustment. Uh, kids need to feel that they have an identity which is not subject to stigmatization. Healthcare teams, I think, really need to assess routinely kids' social adjustments, the potential for diabetes-related stigma and bullying, um, and diabetes management in public settings. And we don't know about this unless we ask it. So uh, it may occur, it may be the kid experiencing it, but if we don't ask, we're not gonna know. And if we want to promote psychosocial adjustment and quality of life and optimal diabetes management, I think as teams, we really need to attend to these issues and promote social support for young people with diabetes. Thanks. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, it's not so much time uh, to start with for each speaker. So now we go on to next speaker. Um, and this is uh, Mr. Nasser Altublani from Bahrain, uh, who will speak about the potential of kids to ensure the well being of students with diabetes and their families. Please, Nasser. Um, thank you, Professor Gum, for the introduction. Um, first of all, my name is Nasser. Um, I was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of two. Um, I went on to university and studied psychology. And uh, throughout my studies, I picked up an interest in spirituality and emotional intelligence as part of my studies. Um, after that, I went on to do my own research and I'm uh, in the process of publishing my first research paper on the role of spirituality and emotional intelligence in self-management in diabetes. I'm also a high school psychology teacher. And throughout my research and my, my interest in, teacher and, in teaching and my experience in teaching as well, I've noticed that um, a lot of students, as uh, Dr. Allen have mentioned, Dr. Natasha as well, um, suffer from a lot of stigmatiza stigmatization, um, social pressure, bullying when it comes to diabetes. As a student um, of diabetes, my, or as a student who uh, was diagnosed with diabetes from an early age, uh, I've noticed that myself as well. So it wasn't very, um, it wasn't very far-fetched for me to notice these things in my students who were diagnosed with diabetes at around the same age. So what I've noticed that a lot of students actually suffer from a lot of shyness. They wouldn't want other students to know that they're diabetics. And with a lot of these students, I would ask why, and the students would say, why would we want the others to know? It's not something that I should be proud of. They're gonna ask a lot of questions. And it seems like those students don't want their diabetes to be in display. The narrative that seems to be attached to diabetes with those kids is a, is a very unhealthy narrative. And with our medical professionals and how the medical um, um, uh, structure is done with the diagnosis, with the treatment, a lot of care is focused on the physical aspect, but very little is focused on the psychological and the mental aspect as well. So students being shy and not being able to um, quote unquote display their diabetes was associated according to research with a lot of missed boluses and with a lot of disengagement from diabetes self-care as well. Um, another issue is um, that, that students suffer from and that I've seen from my own students is um, the fear of social judgment so students face a lot of social distress and as part of my research, I've investigated the role of social distress on HbA1c and self-management behaviors. And I've noticed that with social distress, the, the effect that research has generated is a little bit scattered and it's not necessarily very organized. But most research seem to reach the conclusion that social distress seem to impact the 
um, individual at a very structural level. So when, when I went on and asked those, uh, and I asked peers around the school, what do you know about diabetes? What would you do if a student pumps, uh, a pump peeps in the middle of class, for instance? They'd go, we'd ask some questions. What is this? Um, what's the sound? Is everything okay? And I'd go on and ask teachers as well, what do you do in this case? And not surprisingly, teachers would say, we don't know what to do. And when I ask why, most teachers would say, we either don't have the resources or we're not sure what to do. We're not sure how to deal with them. So I say, what if a student says, I have a hypo? They're like, what's a hypo? And it's, it's, it's quite dangerous that a student or, or a teacher does not necessarily know what to do when a student um, experiences a hypo, experiences, let's say an episode, experiences a hyperglycemic episode as well. So it's very important that teachers as well as students understand what to do um, to help their peers who are um, diagnosed with type one diabetes. Another important point that I'd want to share and would want to kind of uh, bring together what Alan said, my point here was the embarrassment that um, the students face. So with the embarrassment, uh, and I've experienced that as a student as well, whenever my blood sugar is low, I can't participate in a sports event. Um, I can't play football if my blood sugar is high or low. I can't um, do an exam, for instance. Um, my, my pump beeps at the, in the middle of the exam, and then I have to pull it out very shyly, and I have to explain to the examiner that this is not a phone and I'm not teaching. So, so all, of this, all of that could kind of generate a lot of stigmatization and kind of internalize um, discrimination and stigmatization as well. So it might create a very dangerous and a very kind of unhealthy stigma to, oh, sorry, I think my time is up. So what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that the, the healthcare system should be able to um, accommodate for mental as well as physical challenges and not kind of ignore those um, uh, mental, uh, mental comportments and not dealing with them by necessarily only asking questions, but we need to more close, closely assess the narratives. Uh, we need to employ the kids program, which we're sh I'm sure we're gonna discuss it a little bit more uh, during the panel later on. Sorry to take more than I should have from your time. And thanks a lot, Dr. Khan, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Nasser. I'm, I'm sure we will be back with this question, the important question regarding diabetes in school. Now, next speaker uh, is uh, Ms. Tapi Semenya from South Africa, uh, talking about living with diabetes and mental health issues. Please, Tapi. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tapi, and I've been a diabetic for 60 years. I have also been living with bipolar disorder since 2019. And well, my journey began when I was basically in university and one of my fellow friends basically um, decided to commit suicide. Um, I think for me, when that happened, it took a very big toll on my life experience. And I just felt as though, what is life? It, it started bringing up questions as to why would one person go and do something like that? And what decision making process would get them to doing something like that? I must say, growing up, it has not been easy for me to live with diabetes. Um, I also had my struggles. I was not accepting of my condition. I had to go to therapy, I think, for like six years before I could accept that I was living with diabetes. And eventually, I think there came a point where I was like, okay, you know what? Surely there's something that I need to do about this. And that is when I was diagnosed with um, bipolar. I must say it's not easy. Um, I always say to people that living with bipolar and living with diabetes is something terrible. I, I don't wish it upon anybody because firstly, to live with diabetes, you need to be able to have be in a great state of mind and not being in a state of mind that is kind of like conflicting can also cause a lot of problems for you. Um, my takeaway message in my experience living with diabetes and living with bipolar is that we need to be in more empathetic towards one another. We need to hear each other out. Every day is not the same. And, you know, when waking up each and every day and telling yourself, and, you know, I'm going to do this and something along the day just doesn't go your way, it can also have a huge impact in your life. 
I need for me I think even the biggest thing is support from your family support from your people the people living around you it's extremely difficult to not have the necessary support around you and bipolar is an ongoing thing and it's something that has so many struggles I can tell you I've had so many times when I had decided not to take my pills anymore I was like I can do this by myself and I had to go back so empathy the stigma everything else it, it shouldn't really play such an important matter. You need to take care of yourself and feed into your soul. And I think it's very important that, you know, to even communicate it with the people around you. So for me, I think living with that diabetes and bipolar is it's difficult, but it's also doable. And I think what all the other people, um, speakers have also reiterated on is extremely important. We need to be empathetic to one another. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tappy, for raising these very important questions. Uh, next speaker will be Ms. Lucila Gomes from Brazil. Um, she is an IDF Blue Circle Voices member and mother of a child living with type 1 diabetes. And you will talk, Lucila, about the impact of diabetes in the mental health of the extended family. Please. Oh. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so I am a mother of um, a child with type 1 diabetes. My daughter was diagnosed when she was three years old, and now she's 19. And we, we were expat family, so we lived abroad for almost all life. So my, we lived in different countries. And it was very, very hard to move around, to be moving around for every four years and with a type one kid. And one of the most impact things that happened to us was is that we had to change schools with my daughter. And I, I felt that I always had to have my phone with me all the time because I never knew when the schools went to call me. We had different teachers all the time and one of the things that happened is that the school was calling me all the time because something happened and nobody wants, wanted to take care of her. She was very young and no one wants to have like the, the burden to take care of type one kid with diabetes. Once, one of the things that happened once is that we just began a new school and we had, we had just moved to Abu Dhabi. It was a new country, new school. And they called me in the middle of the day and they said, oh, your daughter is not feeling well. And she has a, a low blood sugar. I said, oh, that's fine. There is food in the nurse, with the nurse. I always have like tons of food with the nurse. And they just said, oh, we, but we are not at school. I said, how, how you are not at school? No, we decided to, to do PE outside of school. So I had to drive to a place that I didn't have any idea what it was. My daughter has a 25 uh, blood sugar. On the time I had to drive like crazy in a city that I did I, I couldn't I didn't know where she was so as a family the diabetes impact a lot I had to stop working and I was privileged because I could not work and I always think about other families that the, the parents have to work there was another family in Abu Dhabi that the mom was always sitting down on that coach waiting for her daughter because she said, I just don't leave school because it's just easy for me to stay sitting and waiting for my daughter. Uh, because of that, I decided to organize a support group. So I organized a support group in Abu Dhabi and it was one of the best things that I did. I feel that uh, peer support is one of the most important things that can help the kids with diabetes and the families. I got a lot of support from my friends there are parents for, with kids with diabetes. And I had friends with diabetes, parents of kids with diabetes and grown-ups with diabetes that could help me as well to understand better the, the condition. So this is really, really important. I began to send my daughter to camp because she needed to get to know other kids with diabetes as well. And this makes a lot of difference as well for her. So I feel that it's really, really important for the kids to get to know other kids 
with the same condition. This built up a lot of strength with them. So this is something that I want to share with you. It's really, really nice. I know that my time is up, but that's a little bit that I can share with you. Thank you so very much. Um, I can mention that, that ISPA just launched a new special interest group for diabetes in school. Um, it was launched in Abu Dhabi uh, at the ISPAD meeting just recently. And we will have a uh, platform on the ISPAD homepage for this. Um, sorry, my video, start my video. So we will have a platform on ISPAD homepage on this very special um, issue too. Uh, it is not there up and running yet, but it's very soon. Okay, now I will invite the panel to 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 uh, not stop the videos any longer, but come on to the screen and and we will start the discussion panel. We have got some uh, questions. Um, to start, we we'll, we have some questions for you, Natasha, and then we have some for for um, Alan. Uh, Natas, are you with us? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, yes. Um, which specialist takes care of kids with type 1 diabetes on the primary care level in Slovenia? Is it family doctors, general pediatrician, children, adult endocrinologist, or any other specialist? And other, how is it in other countries? In Slovenia, all children with diabetes are treated in our center where pediatric endocrinologists work. We are quite a big group and primary pediatricians, pediatricians in primary care just give us local support. But for diabetes, we are involved for all children up to the age of 22. Okay, so you 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 keep them up in what other countries might regard as adult um, ages, but I think that's very good because you are not always mature enough when you are when you are eighteen. Well, I just today saw a very nice girl. She will turn eighteen next week, and she asked me to transfer her to uh, an adult endocrinologist because she lives far away from Ljubljana, and it will be much easier. I think it's important that they have uh, the possibility to choose whether to stay with us as students or to move closer to home. We also organize a special transition clinic for more than half of the patients uh, where uh, one of us in person uh, takes this uh, adult young person with diabetes to the new doctor, introduces uh, him, and that makes it much easier. Thank you. Ellen, uh, this is a question for you. Um, has the influence of peer support, for example, diabetes bodies, diabetes camp, et cetera, been proven to have a significant influence on the mental health of type one diabetes kids? Yeah, yeah I'm, and you know, there, there actually is not a great um, evidence base for, for that, but it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, it's intuitive. Uh, we all can understand that kids do better and their mental health is improved when they're accepted by their peer group, when they have friends, when they're getting support, when they're engaged in, in activities with their friends and so on, uh, they, they are gonna do better. There, um, you know, the, the, the review paper that I cited in my brief talk um, did indicate that uh, there's better support for the idea that when kids are having problems with their peers, they're also having problems with diabetes. Then there is data showing that when kids are feeling well supported, they're doing better. But um, I think it, you know, the general issue of our kids well adjusted socially to the degree that they are and to the degree they will be better in the terms of their mental health. That was one question. And to the degree that their mental health is is good and optimal, their diabetes will also be better. So the, the clearly there's connections between uh, between diabetes management and one's mental and social well-being. Thank you. Another question for you, diabetes related. Um, sorry, sorry, okay. Professor Gunn. Can I can I add a little bit something to that to what Alan mentioned? Absolutely. Um, so so I, I think I think it's huge that um, you know the the kids uh, do get the kind of 
um, the social support from from other students, from their peers as well. But I think it's as equally important for schools to become a platform for the kids to to be empowered. And since Diabetes Day is coming up, what I've noticed that a lot of students who were previously shy and they, they wouldn't want others to know that they're diabetics, when given the right platform, they would actually go up and speak up and they'd notice themselves speaking about diabetes like they've never done before. So I think empowerment is a, like schools have a huge um, power to reshape the narrative that those kids have. Um, another thing that Bruno has shared with me earlier was um, the kids program, which um, is a, a great pack and a great resource for teachers to be able to understand and to be able to educate other kids about what's diabetes. So when a five-year-old kid pulls up an insulin pump in front of other kids, they don't ask if this is a bomb or is it a, you know, it's a Game Boy or it's a PSP, it's a new game. Um, so for students to be able to understand and to be able to break off this novelty with some education and fun tools, I think that would be a great asset to achieve what Ellen was um, kind of um, saying um, a little bit before. May, yeah. If I may uh, go and I just want to respond. Nazar, thank you so much for really highlighting that. It made me think of a, um, you know, a couple more points about this. One is a study that was done about 15 years ago that didn't get a lot of attention, but I think is really significant. And that was a study by Julie Wagner in the United States. And she showed that when kids were teaching other kids in their classroom about diabetes, and when the teachers themselves received diabetes education, those kids had better subsequent metabolic control. They did better with their diabetes and they did better socially. So really normalizing this and, and that that like totally uh, uh, takes uh, stigmatization out of the picture. It totally derails the process of stigmatization when kids tell their friends. Uh, and one other final point, I, I remember very early in my career, I met a kid at a diabetes summer camp where I was working that said, no, they never tell their friends about them having diabetes. That kid was very distressed. And we did role plays with all the kids about how you communicate with other kids about your diabetes in ways that are effective. And I think that's a major issue. But the schools is really under, I think, I think it's an opportunity that we haven't yet developed enough, enough programming for. Thanks, Nasser. Do, do you want to add something, Lucila? You have uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, what I saw uh, where my daughter went to school, there are there are there are a few kids with diabetes, and what what I noticed was exactly that the kids that used to use the pump in the middle of the belly showing up were the kids that didn't have any problems with bullying or other things, but the kids that used to hide the pumps were exactly the kids that used to be bullied about it, and it was really really interesting to see that. And like my daughter used to say to all her friends and to everybody, I am uh, half, uh, she was really funny about it. She used to say, I, I am like a half robot because I don't have a pancreas. I have like this thing and this works for me. So I am like, I'm, I, I have like a, I am a robot. So, and those, everybody was like, really? Yes, I am so special because I have something that you don't have. And she was never, never bullied about it. But there are other kids that used to say, oh, I don't want to show my pump to everyone. And these kids were so picky about it. And, and it was really, really interesting. And I was asking her, why do you want to show your pump? She said, I need to. I need to show my pump because nobody will pick on me because of my pump. Nobody will pick on me because of my sensor. And it was really interesting the way that she realized the more she showed it up, the less she'll be bullied about it. Smart girl. <laughs> yes. Congrats to your daughter. Yes. Tapi, so, you would like to, oh, sorry, Lucila, you weren't, hadn't finished. No, no. So, it's, so it was really interesting to see the difference on behavior, on, but the shyest kids would be, behave differently and they would be picked about it. So it was interesting to see the difference on behavior and how how the, the how the kids can relate on that and they know how to bully the, the kids that cannot defend themselves. Exactly. 
Tapi, uh, do you want to add something? I'm um, sure. Um, so for me, I would I would say that I had parents who used to always like tell my friends for me, like to say I'm a diabetic and you know she's living with diabetes and everything like that. And I must say, if you're not prepared um, as a child as well, you need to fully be self-aware and self like prepared for it so that people can understand. Because if you're not prepared, it tends to be a bit overwhelming. I found that for me, it was a bit of a struggle when somebody was talking on my behalf, um, like my parents. But when I was finally prepared, it was more of a step where I could just be like, okay, I am diabetic and this is me. And I would find it much more easier to explain it myself to my friends. And it made me feel, I felt empowered by it. Whereas when my parents are speaking about it, I just kind of felt like, you know, they just want people to know. So you need to sometimes allow your child or like yourself as living with diabetes as a child to get like to kind of prepare yourself for it. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question um, originally for Alan, but I think it's for all of, of you in the panel too. Uh, diabetes related stress and poor control. What, can, what came first, chicken and egg? It could be poor control and so a perception of stigma. What do you think about this? Should you start perhaps, Alan? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, kids, uh, I, I think that that's a good question, first of all, um, you know, the chicken and the egg type of question. We're looking at associations, but we do have data that shows that if you intervene directly on stress and teach, give kids the resources, the, the abilities and the skills to manage their stress more effectively, that their subsequent glycemic control can improve. So this would argue for, you know, uh, a, a direct role of reduct, stress reduction on improved glycemic control. Um, I, I think that there are all the other associations we know about stress and, and suboptimal glycemic control uh, is correlational. Uh, so in that case, we can't say what caused what. But uh, because there is evidence on both sides, actually, I mean, if if people are stressed and feeling depressed and anxious and so on, their physiology is is different in a way that could promote hyperglycemia. Um, and um, it's you know, it's it's a it's a good question. But clinically, when we see kids that are distressed and that distress can come from lots of different places today, our focus is on. Uh, peer relationships that lead to stigmatic stig stigmatization and um, bullying and victimization that increases stress certainly, and and the effect of that we could model it out and try to figure out what what goes awry. Well, kids may not want to perform diabetes management in public in front of their friends, so there is a mechanism for behavioral uh, influences on glycemic control through not effective management of, of uh, diabetes. Uh, I think that's some of the more compelling data actually in the, in the stigma literature that shows that kids who don't want to talk about their diabetes, don't want to have their equipment visible, and don't want to take insulin in front of others are kids who end up with worse control. And again, that larger study from Canada was um, uh, almost 400 kids in that study. That's still associational data, correlational data, but it kind of makes sense if you think about how that might play out. Thank you. We got another question here. How do you address concerns of parents who are in denial about the condition of their kids with diabetes and sometimes blaming each other? It was a question put for Natasha, but uh, I think all the panel uh, has this issue on yeah. their thoughts. Yes, this can be this can be a big pro problem in Slovenia. Perhaps not that big, but we know patients from, um, let's say Kosovo, and there it's it's really uh, diabetes is a disease that can, that that must be hidden from others because if people know that a child has diabetes, uh, then he cannot uh, get a job or be married. So we had patients who were coming from Kosovo to Slovenia for outpatient clinic visits. 
So, um, of course, parents sometimes blame themselves, especially if they are having type 1 diabetes as well. So, in both cases, I think it's a step by step procedure, uh, trying to find out why they are hiding diabetes in front of uh, their neighbors or friends or, or even sometimes uh, their relatives. I also knew a very young girl from Slovenia uh, where her partner uh, didn't allow her to tell anybody that she has diabetes. Uh, she was not allowed to inject insulin in front of uh, his family. So it can be really a big burden uh, for a young person with diabetes. So um, usually we work together with our psychologist as a team, uh, discuss and try to find solutions step by step. Uh, so it's, it, it, we cannot give a prescription how to resolve this problem. We must find out about the family, about the family background, uh, their neighbors, their peers, and then try to find uh, the right way to really in the next month resolve this, this terrible situation for a child. Thank you. Is anyone else in the panel willing to, to say something on this issue? Well, okay. Neyser, were you going to say something? No? Lucilla? You have to unmute yourself. Unmute. I, I saw in, uh, I think this is very, I, I agree with Dr. Natasa, and I saw this is very cultural when I was living in Abu Dhabi, and I think uh, probably Nasser in, in Bahrain, he can, he can tell me if it's similar. I saw in Abu Dhabi that there's, there are a lot of very traditional families. They have the same problem. They, it was very cultural, and they, did, they didn't want to show the problem to their families. So it was very hidden. And it was very, very, very complicated because they didn't want to show. So it was a problem that we have to work around. The families couldn't, the kids couldn't show that they had the, the, the diabetes. So it was very, very complicated. And I don't, I don't know if Nasser had the same problem in Bahrain with the traditional families. Probably Nasser can oh. tell something about it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I actually found it, um, I, I wouldn't say it was easy, but, but I think, be, being in a part of a collectivistic um, society, if you'd want to call it that, um, has helped to an extent. Um, being a diabetic since the age of two, and now I'm, what, 23, I've never been, you know, it's kind of never felt very lonely, you know, and with, with diabetes, it's a very lonely disease because, you know, everyone around you gets to do whatever they want, you know, and they just assume you're okay because physically you look fine, you know, and there is nothing majorly wrong with you. But with, with being part of this, I'd say, type of culture, we've always had a very maternal and a paternal um, caregiver, you know, type of culture. Um, the nurses, the medical staff, other diabetics, um, family, uh, I was always around family that it, they'd always take care of me. Sometimes maybe it's a little bit too much, it takes a lot away from my agency, but I don't think I've seen it from that perspective that I, I don't think I've seen anyone's family who are kind of reluctant to share that their kid is diabetic. Maybe part of the denial at first, they wouldn't want to show cause they don't believe it yet. But I don't think they wouldn't want to show it because they're embarrassed that their kid is diabetic. I, I haven't seen that yet. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, Nasser, you have got another question from you. You have part, partly uh, answered it uh, so far, but from your perspective as a teacher and person living with diabetes, how can school staff be better prepared to ensure the well-being of students living with diabetes. 
Yes, yeah, so, so I think I touched upon this earlier and I'm um, nowhere near an expert here, but from I, I can tell from my own experience as a teacher and a diabetic, um, I, I think a huge part of living well as a diabetic is living um, well as part of a healthy culture. If you live in, in, a, in a healthy culture in terms of diabetes, it can contribute a lot to your mental health. And what I mean by that is the culture one has to understand what diabetes is, what does it entail, and third, what the consequences of diabetes are to both your mental and physical health. Um, so a, a huge part of my interventions, whatever I did uh, with, diabetes, with individuals living with diabetes in school last year and the year before, was empowerment, Diabetes Day. Um, it created a lot of normalization for the culture of diabetes. Kids were uh, went up and spoke about, you know, and then look at my sensor, here it is, and look at my pump site, and um, this is what I do, this is what I can eat. This is, you say, I can't eat, but I can eat it if I regulate my blood sugar, blah, blah, blah. And when those kids get some agency about what narrative they want the other kids to know, I think it creates uh, a very, um, healthy schema for them. Um, another part of it is definitely educating the adults, not, not just the kids. If the adults are educated, the parents, um, if the teachers, the administrators are educated, the kids won't mind. So whatever is normalized within the school staff is normalized for the kids as well. So using interactive programs such as the kids program, um, when a kid um, pulls up his insulin pump, for instance, in class, and the teacher makes fun or makes a comment of that, you're allowing the other kids to make fun of that kid as well. So it's establishing the culture within the school as well as part of the activities, celebrating having a day for diabetes, November 14th or whatever day you wanna put on the calendar, I think is very important for um, creating the culture and ensuring the well-being of kids with diabetes in schools. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. A topic question for you here. Have you ever felt discriminated against by the school staff? Um, no, I haven't. I think where I went to school, it was very much a small community and they always made sure that I was always supported in my journey and always made to feel at home whether i was you know having diabetes or whether it was bipolar or any other condition that i had that's great to hear actually um we have got a, a question here um as a specialist of diabetes and haad the talks should not miss mention a genetic overlap of diabetes type 1 and hdhd we should screen for HDHD when problems in diabetes control occur or last for a longer time, especially in adolescents. What do you think about that, Natasa? Well, uh, thank you. This is a very interesting question. We did a study, this is now, I believe, five years ago, when we invited a group of more than 100 children uh, to uh, resolve a special questionnaire together with their parents. And among this group, we found a 10% group uh, who uh, where HDH was conform confirmed. And those were children with worse metabolic control. Um, at that time, we had a very nice discussion with our psychiatrist who says that this can be, of course, another burden for the family and that uh, it is very important that this is recognized and that they get support. But an additional comment that our psychiatrist had is that we always should think that perhaps parents have the same attention deficit disorder and this could be another idea why diabetes is really not well controlled in these families. So we were following up a group of these children uh, who were supported uh, with psychotherapy, psychology support, and uh, in some cases also uh, medical therapy. Um, and we really saw that these, these were children who had huge problems in coping with all skills that diabetes uh, uh, has. So injecting insulin, measuring blood glucose, dealing with the pump, calculating carbs, uh, they could not focus on it. 
If I may uh, add to that, uh, and I'm sorry I, I cut out there. I had a Wi-Fi problem for a few minutes. <laughs> but um, actually, uh, ADHD is now there. I mean, I think it's pretty well established that there are associations between ADHD and worse outcomes in diabetes management. Most of that can be traced to one of the core deficits in ADHD, which is executive functioning problems. So the problems of organization, control of attention, attending to detail, remembering to do things, all that, doesn't it sound like diabetes management? In order to do well with diabetes management, you need good executive functioning. And so it's not a surprise, but we should. Someone said about, should we screen for that? Yes, we should screen for all kinds of psychological disorders, um, ADHD included, depression, anxiety, disordered eating, et cetera, because all of these factors will make diabetes management more challenging. And, and then, of course, we have to have an organization to, to, to follow up this, uh, the outcome of this screening. Uh, it's uh, a bit unethical to screen for things that you can't help people with if you find them, of course. Um, someone is asking, how can we empower the clinical team to address psychology and diabetes in the limited consultation time especially when there is no uh, psychologist input or psi input in the diabetes team? Well, that is the question, isn't it? And um, in fact, um, ISPAD, for example, does absolutely recommend that psychologists be part of teams or in, in situations where the team doesn't have a psychologist, that there, that there are psychologists and psychiatrists and other mental health professionals that are easily accessible. And that is often a challenge. And as um, I think as Gun, you just mentioned, uh, if you screen and you find problems, then you really have to do something about it. And so the team therefore must be committed to making sure that those kids get the treatments that they need, the support that they need to be able to um, manage their life better, their diabetes included. Uh, but unfortunately, what we know is that when kids are referred for psychological treatment, most of them don't make it to the psychologist, the psychiatrist, and whoever else. We can overcome that problem if we integrate psychologists and other behavioral health professionals within the diabetes team. And fortunately, more and more teams are doing this. And I think that's really a good sign for diabetes uh, management. Can I ask you, the three of you who so represent persons with diabetes, have you ever met psychologists during your childhood as a child with diabetes? I mean, is it a natural um, person in the diabetes team from where you come? Um, yeah, um, for, for me, no, that, that was never the case. Um, I, I've never met, it, it was never part of the diabetes, diabetes team. Um, as part of the recommendations of my research right now, I'm recommending the implementation of um, having a psychologist within the diabetes team. But from where I come from, um, it's, it's never been an option. You, you don't even get referred to um, a psychologist, even if you show certain symptoms. Um, unless the doctor can see them very clearly, then they'd refer you to a psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, for me, it was part of my, my team. Um, that was due to the fact that I was already struggling with my diabetes at a young age and it was something that they had diagnosed very um, quickly. So it was prescribed to me at a very young age. What about you, Lucilla, and your daughter? Did you, were you offered to, to, to see a psychologist as a natural thing in the diabetes team? No. No, for Anna, she never had uh, a, psych uh, a psychologist. So we never saw, she just had an endocrinologist. It was the only doctor that she always had. So she, we never had any, unfortunately, because I thought it was going to be very good for her and for me, but we never had any. You know, according to the ISPAD guidelines, for example, it should be a psychologist, a competence or a social worker, both preferably and a doctor and a nurse. Uh, so, and the dietitian, of course. So, so it's not really a diabetes team if you don't have all these people around the child and the, and the parents. Yeah, if, I can, if I can add something, 
Also in Slovenia, when I started to work, okay, this is long ago, but we had a psychologist who uh, was sharing four times, four hours a week with our children, but she never had time. So we were actually also without a psychologist. And then 20 years ago, we managed with the help uh, from our Society for Children with Diabetes uh, to engage a psychologist at the beginning for two days in a week. But then finally the hospital employed this young uh, psychologist. And then we really started, this is now really more than 20 years, with a very good psychological support program for us, it is really a must, as I hope in most of the centers, that psychologist approaches the family immediately after diagnose, and then we offer regular psychological support. Uh, I quite frequently work as a team with our psychologists. So we sit with the family together and discuss different topics that are uh, becoming an increasing problem. And of course, we are also doing the screening, uh, the yearly screening for emotional disorders, burden of diabetes and so on. But the start, what was not easy and with the help of our society, I don't know if we would manage to, to, to get a member, uh, to get a psychologist as a member of the team. Uh, I think it's, a real, it's really a challenge. Um, I saw in the chat, uh, someone from Australia said that, you know, parents are desperate to find more psychologists to help with their kids. And there aren't enough of them that are involved in diabetes care. And all of that is true. So, I mean, it, it really is a matter of I think advocacy um, and who we, we who do we advocate to? We have to advocate to, uh, to to national organizations and insurance companies and funders and it's really political will in, in a lot of ways too to to make sure that that because we do know I mean it is as far as I'm concerned it's conclusive that uh, psychological factors must be addressed as part of the co comprehensive care of children with diabetes. It's not even a question anymore. Um, and the question, but the question is how we how we do it. And one final point, just real quick, is that because uh, Natasha, you mentioned about even from the time of diagnosis, that incorporating the psychologist as part of the treatment team is so essential because then it's not it's it's normal. It's just part of another team member that you see. It's not you don't have to be really nuts to go see the psychologist. And in fact, if we wait that long, then the psychologist is going to be just using all their time to spend a few kids, spend time with a few kids who have serious problems. On the other hand, if we build psychological principles into disease management from early on as part of clinic visits routinely, then we can prevent a lot of these problems in the first place. And there are studies that actually show that to be the case. When you integrate uh, di uh, psychological uh, management into routine clinic visits, kids do better with their diabetes management. So there it is. We just have to figure out how to do it. Yeah, thank you. And we have a question. What are the scientific standardized assessment tools for diabetes for social or psychosocial, psychological issues? Uh, well, I'll, I'll take that one real quick. I mean, there, there are a number of standardized measures that could be used for screening. And we, we published a paper, I think, in Pediatric Diabetes in 21, about our comprehensive screening program that we use in Miami. Um, so these are brief measures that can be done. Our screening protocol takes, takes kids on average 10 minutes or 12 minutes to complete prior to their clinic visit. Um, and uh, these though are only screeners. So what that means is that in order to really assess the social adjustment and the psychological functioning, if a kid screens positive, then there are more um, in-depth uh, tools that that the psychologist or other professional would use to really figure out what's going on. So the screening only gives you an indicator. Oh yes, it looks like there could be a problem here, and that requires further assessment. So I mean, there are quite a few uh, reliable, valid uh, tools that we have available to measure. Someone asked, what can we do to patients receiving care in resource-limited facilities that don't have neither the endocrin endocrinologist nor psychologist? Yeah, that's tricky. Does anyone want to answer that question? 
Natasha, are you? Yeah, this is this is really a tough question. Um, I can see that we are very privileged because all children in Slovenia have access to our uh, hospital, to our department, uh, and to let's say a very high level of care. Uh, and we are also let's say systematically searching for those who miss their appointments and invite them again. But of course, there are many countries where such access is not uh, available. Uh, even we sometimes get um, uh, um, informations from uh, uh, other countries uh, and parents ask us if they can come and discuss uh, problems child has with us. Of course, we are happy to invite them, but this can be uh, the cost can be very high. So for sure, for people from, uh, let's say, uh, low social economic countries, this is not possible. So perhaps in the future, we can offer them some Zoom meetings, some video conferences with advices and try to share our knowledge. But for sure, I don't believe we can find a uniform solution. Another question is, are there plans to have online diabetes training for teachers? Have you heard of such uh, things, Nasser? Um, I, I think the, um, the the IDF, they do kind of send out and they do offer some programs here and there. Um, but, but I think uh, a more comprehensive and all the time available resource is the kids program. Um, so, so I'm, I'm going to go on and recommend it again. I know I've suggested it a couple of times, but all questions seem to feed back into the same, the same point of advocacy when it comes to kids and teachers. I think it's a, it's a very entertaining way for kids to know about diabetes and for teachers to teach themselves and to teach their students about diabetes as well. So I think it can have the impact that this question is looking for. Yeah. Thank you. We have got an answer from in Canada. We have online resources for teachers. Uh, World Wide Web Diabetes at School dot Canada, CA Canada. So we can have a look at that. Thank you. Um, someone says, I will be very glad. If, the, in, if in the future, some lessons are given to empower those of us in resource limited countries like in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. So I think we can agree on that um, web-based um, education is so important these days because so many people have access to, to cell phones and, and computers, much more so than <laughs> regular diabetes teams. Uh, it, the uh, in terms of the web resource, I see in the chat uh, there were some questions about where, how can we access screening measures, psychological screening measures, and all that. There are toolkits. I think the American Diabetes Association web website has some tools um, listed. And I just see Francine is mentioning something. There's there's a list through another resource that's that's right there. Um, I will mention as well that uh, we, we just published a paper this just a couple months ago, actually, on how parents and, and kids feel about psychological screening. The, we did this on our own clinic, so we did in-depth interviews with them. And I mean, they are, for the most part, well, I would say almost entirely very, very positive about this. They had suggestions about how we can improve the screening protocols that we use. But one of the issues that the that one of them that several of the mothers raised was when we go to see a psychologist, if we've been referred to a psychologist in the community, not as part of our team, but in the community outside of the clinic, she says it's so frustrating because they don't know about diabetes. And so really, when you talk about having good psychological care for kids with diabetes, you have to have professionals who know about diabetes in order to do that care properly. Um, and they felt very frustrated. They have to start all over, you know, with diabetes 101 with some of these, uh, with, with the, some of the therapists in the community. Um, one of the things that I think is really positive that the American Diabetes Association did in the last five years is they partnered with the American Psychological Association. So at least in the United States, 
we have a method for training psychologists and other health professionals, other mental health professionals about diabetes management so they can actually be effective in working with uh, patients who have diabetes. It is an online, most of that is also an online training. Um, so there are resources out there. Tapi, is it something you would like to add in this question? Not for the moment. We have another uh, question here or statement. Many of our newly diagnosed teens with type one diabetes do not want other to know that they have type one diabetes and do not want support from our psychosocial team. Anyone has an innovative program or strategy that may help these youth? Has it partly to do with denial and stigma, you think? Again, no easy solution is there. Uh, all members with the, of the team uh, are invited to discuss this with the family uh, and all should focus on the same information, same support, encourage the child to explain himself in front, perhaps at the beginning two or three peers and then uh, more friends. Uh, if we just push them forward, you must do it. Uh, it's wise to do it. For sure, this is not a solution. But I think it is very important that the dietitian, nurse educators, doctors, psychologists all share the same information. As we heard before, if you cope with your diabetes, perhaps it will be easier among the, your friends because they will not ask you all the time or, or let's say uh, there will be no uh, pressure. Oh, you have drugs, you inject yourself. We know how children can be. So um, I believe that everybody uh, in our group who works with children with diabetes meets this pro program. Uh, it can be quite frequent. Again, it depends on cultural background, on, on uh, environment where the child is living. Uh, but to, to have a recipe, how to resolve this problem, it's impossible. What do you well, think? I, I don't think it's impossible, but it's very challenging you know, because it's different than the kid who was diagnosed at age three, four or five. When you're 12, 13, 14 and diagnosed, it's totally a different thing because what are the kids developmentally dealing with at that time? They're trying to figure out who they are. And this complicates the matter tremendously for them. But I wanted to just emphasize something uh, that Dr. Bertina mentioned in her talk, which is the extreme importance of the team members responding with empathy to the kids that they care for and taking the time to listen to what their issues are and then taking the time to reflect back what they hear them say. This provides tremendous support. And it, it, we know that it's getting support from the team instead of judgments and, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that, you should do better. That doesn't work. Uh, but when the kids feel support by their doctors and by the all members of the team, because the team can utilize effective communication strategies like that and be empathic, I think that's really, really important. Yes, and I wanted to add something. I work in outpatient clinic, clinic almost every day. And when I meet children, then I usually say, oh, how are you? And they say, oh, it's not good. I have high blood glucose. And I usually answer, no, I'm not asking about your blood glucose. I'm asking how you are. And then sometimes they start to talk, oh, I won a math competition. I'm going to run next week. So I try to focus on other things because I, I think children must see that we don't see them as blood glucose as blood glucose excursions, but we know that they are children with their hopes and wishes. And I try to focus on this. And then the diabetes comes at the end. Uh, I have to say, Dr. Natasha, honestly, I, I, I love your technique. Um, as, a, as a diabetic, I see how, you know, that I think fits in very well to, to, to the needs of the patient as one. Well. And I have to agree, I don't think there is a quick fix or there is an easy recipe to, to get over the denial. If a kid does not want to share, okay, that's completely fine. If a kid wants to hide their diabetes for a year, two, three, four, five, there, there is no timeline or a deadline to it. 
I think it's it's all about the schema, the, the narrative that the kid has around diabetes, about their own diagnosis. And I think forcing them to share or nudging them a piece too far might be very out of character for them. And the aftermath of that to their diabetes, to their own mental health might be catastrophic. So kind of, kind of letting them go by their own pace, not, you know, and seeing them beyond their diabetes is extremely important. Diabetics are not people with superpowers. We're just people, you know, and, and it's fine. We make mistakes and, you know, you don't have a deadline to um, tell people about your insecurities and about the things that you don't want to share. Why do I have to have a deadline? So I think it's, a, it's an important consideration to have, you know, seeing diabetics much more than their diabetes is, is an extremely important belief to have. Um, thank you, Dr. Natasha, for share, sharing that. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. And, and I have to add that it's a certain privilege to see these families with their kids with diabetes and follow them year by year and see how they grow and what, what uh, interests they have in life and sports and uh, whatever they are interested in. It's a real privilege. And I think we have to, to accept that it must have take time. Uh, you should see them at least four times a year and you should have at least um, 45 minutes Per, per meeting, which is way too much in some countries, but I think it is needed really to, to have the chance to speak both with the child and with the parents and talk about and all the issues around the child, all the, not issues, but well, what the child likes, how life is, et cetera, et cetera. It's not all about the blood glucose, of course, just that's just one little part of the life of, of the child. Um, Dr. Dr. Gant, can I yes. add something? Uh, yes, I'd like to add about what Nasser and Dr. Natasa said. Uh, another thing about the importance of the support group of peer or peer groups, because it's not all about the blood glucose. It's sometimes it's important for the kid to see that it's uh, it's okay to, to do mistakes and to do. It's not just Sometimes when we have a peer group in my house, I, I used to connect all the kids and kids and grown-ups with diabetes. We, do like, we did like a afternoon in my house. And one day it was very, very interesting. I have a friend with type one diabetes, my age, and we were having a coffee. And my daughter, she was around seven, was with us. And my friend was telling me, oh, you cannot believe today I was moving and I completely forgot to take my insulin. And my daughter was like, her eyes was like this size. And I was, I just look at her and I was with my friend. Oh, okay, don't worry. Are you feeling okay now? No, I'm feeling okay. I took my insulin three hours after I had a high glucose, uh, high blood glucose. And my daughter was like, and I just look at my daughter and said, you see, it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes because you are not, you are not a superhero. You don't have to be perfect all the time. It's just okay. And my daughter was like, Andy Bahi, she, she, does, she does mistakes as well. Yes, and it's fine. It don't, you, because my daughter was like, she had to, do, to be super perfect. And I was like, you know, it's okay. You can make mistakes. And if you forget, you just correct after and it's fine. So it's so good, peer support, it's so good. It's, I, I think it's just, this, just the most important thing that you can do because you see the other mistakes, and you just see, I'm okay, I can do it, and it's fine. So it's, it's really, really, really important when you are where other persons, other kids, and other grown ups, and you just can share experience and you realize that you're not alone. And it's, I, I really, really feel that all the kids and grown ups with diabetes, they need to have peer support. It's something that it's really, really important. Thank you. The sentence, you are not alone, I think is very essential. Um, I think you all of you can read the, the chat. Is it any question that we haven't um, picked up yet? There's so, so many questions. Um, is, um, one, one existential question is, we have here an autoimmune disease with no real cure existent for what feels like forever. 
though technology is moving forward fast, I just don't see a cure on the horizon. I feel like this is not given enough attention globally. Yes, um, it's a burden, of course, to have a chronic disease that so far is not been able to cure. Um, Tapi, what do you say? You're dealing with these things. Where are you? I've lost you on the screen here. Do you hear me, Tapi? Um, I think she left. Um, no, here, I, here you oh. are, Tapi. She's back. I saw some. It's somewhere. Can you can you hear me, Tapu? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. You press missed with the the sentence. Um, someone wrote that we have a severe autoimmune disease with no real cure existent for what feels like forever. Though technology is moving forward fast, I just can't see a cure on the horizon. I feel like this is not given enough attention globally. What do you think about that? How could we do better? I mean, it is true. Um, I think we aren't paying attention to finding ways, especially, I mean, coming from an, a continent like Africa, there's not enough research being done in Africa. There's not enough funding, obviously, for the research. Um, and I must say, it is very difficult to keep that hope up to say, you know, we are expecting a cure or expecting a way to prevent, um, like, getting conditions like diabetes or even like bipolar. But I must say, it is very important to just have that little bit of hope. Um, and I think... For me, it has been very easy to do that because of advocacy and getting to connect with people around the world. So, you know, just keep the hope. It will come one day. Um, it's very little hope, but it can happen and it will happen as long as we just continue to believe so. And we mustn't forget that research has come very far, just the last two, one or two decades, it has happened so many things in a positive direction. We are coming close to the end of this session, not yet really, but um, could you, all of you um, five in the panel, try to find a, a nice um, answer to this question, how to get people not living with diabetes interested to know more about the disease to avoid prejudice and stigma in the school environment. Okay, I can start. In Slovenia, uh, we started with a special educational program in 1998. So more than 20 years ago, it's a quiz about living with type one or type two diabetes. Children above the age of 12 are invited to participate. They have special lectures about diabetes and at the end they write a written test. Uh, of course, we always find uh, a country winner uh, in knowledge about diabetes. And if you think that uh, more than 10,000 children participate every year and that this program is held for more than 20 years, I am very much sure that we increase knowledge about diabetes. Thank you. That's impressing, Natasa. Thank we have you. Just, we have just a few minutes left until closing remarks. So can you please, uh, the others, the, those others of you, make a short answer? How can we make people not living with diabetes interested in diabetes? Uh, I believe that education, I agree with Dr. Natasha, education is the best thing that we can do. So we need to educate the teachers and we need to educate the kids. And maybe in a fun way, I used to go to school every year to talk about diabetes with the teachers and with the kids. So this was my job every year, every beginning of the, of the year, I was going to school, talking to all the teachers and talking to all the peers about diabetes and maybe this was the reason that my daughter was never bullied. And so I always believed in education, 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 education. Every year when my daughter was older, I didn't have to go to school anymore because she was the one educating, educating the, the teachers and the peers. 
So I highly be uh, believe in education. So this is what I can say about it. Thank you. And, you know, and it's, it's actually uh, increasing awareness is done through education, but you know, every teacher is going to see a kid with diabetes at some point there. It's just because of the, you know, the prevalence of diabetes, whether type one or type two, every school has got a number of children with diabetes. So in the past, it's really been up to the parent to advocate for their child, go to the school, like Lucila has done, talk with the teachers, make sure they understand what their child needs, because diabetes doesn't go away between, you know, in, during the school day, it's still there. And up until fairly recently, I think in the United States, kids, I mean, kids were often discriminated against by the school policies to be, you know, not able to inject insulin in class, not even check their glucose, except they had to leave the room to go to the nurse's office. So there's a lot that was put on the parents and then the healthcare team as well. But I think this, what you're suggesting and what I guess you're doing in Slovenia makes more sense if it's done in a larger way. I think we use um, not just, um, you know, kind of overall educational programs that could go out to all schools and all teachers, but we Thank must you, also Thank have you, social media programs as well. Yeah. Thank you. Nasser and Tapi, a very short comment as the last one. I mean, for me, I think following on black like, campaigns like Language Matters, it was a huge campaign. I think for especially, the, I mean, I thought Language Matters only was for diabetes. And then I started learning that even how people talk to me about my bipolar really does matter. I don't want to hear things like, oh, did you take your pills today? Because it can be very condescending. So campaigns that are on a wild, worldwide scale, like Language Matters, are very important. And obviously to reiterate everybody else's um, <laughs> point as also diabetes education needs to be really put on focus right now. And I think it is, but it can also be better and on a larger scale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nasser. Yeah, uh, and I think what, what can go hand in hand with education, I think stories, you know, I want people who are um, diagnosed with diabetes to come up and say, you know, this is my story and this is my, this is how my day to day goes and this is what I have to do when I travel, I need to pack so many needles and so many injections and whatsoever, right. So those st stories, I think, evoke a lot of um, sense of empathy of um, relatedness. Um, and I think it can highlight a lot of um, the, the, the things that we want to achieve on an emotional and not just on a mental level as well. Um, but thanks a lot for the discussion. That was, that was great. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kong, for facilitating it. Thank you so much to the panel. Uh, it's time for the closing remarks. If I can have that slide, please. So thank you again, and thanks to Sanofi for their support to this webinar and the Kids Project. And all these um, recording slides and feedback questionnaire will be sent to all the registrants in a few days. And please respond to the feedback questionnaire and send any questions you have to kids at the idf.org. Thank you so much for participating in this webinar. Bye-bye. <laughs>